Greetings and lots of love to you, my fellow time travellers. As always, I'm glad to have you with me as we journey through the history of the British Isles together. Um, it's a new year. Um, I'd like to think it would be a happy new year, at least for some. Uh, but it's, it's difficult to see it that way, from the dark of the bottom of January. <laughs> with everything stretched out ahead of us. Um, but hey, we've got history. We've got history as a, as a ladder. We've got history as, a, as a, a ladder that reaches up above us and it disappears down beneath our feet. Uh, and we can just keep climbing up that ladder and that'll keep us right and that'll give us things to hold on to in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, before we get started on today's episode, thanks again to all the people uh, who've joined patreon.com, joined my site, uh, because by subscribing to the Patreon presence, uh, that financial support makes possible the love letters and everything else that we do. So if you're a member, thank you. If you're not a member and you'd like to join and it's high time you did, uh, go to patreon.com, look for me by name, become a member. Uh, you can join for the month or join for the year and it's cheaper if you join for the year. It's cheaper by the dozen. Uh, you get access to uh, question and answers, vodcasts, competitions, all sorts. And you get access to each other. comes together, you come together as a community and a family. Um, which has got to be good for inquiring, questioning minds like ours. Okay, enough of the self-promotion. It's time to strap into the time machine as we set off on the next stop on my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. and fluxes and frenzies and foul evils. There was consumption, dysentery, measles, rickets, scurvy and heaven knows what else. In this podcast, I'm going to try and take you to a place where all your modern senses will be bombarded. A cesspit ripe with every stink, animal and human. Streets crowded with humanity and animal life. Claustrophobic. Some lined with the rotting body parts of dismembered criminals and traitors. 16th century London, the greatest industrial centre in the land. Striding into this world was a man who entertained the throngs, conjuring and conceiving magical words and language that have moved and shaped the whole world. I'm stepping out across Britain, to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me, and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. In the last episode, we stepped inside a palace that definitely has panache delving into the origins of the world's best-selling book. Where are we now? Paul, we are in a place that would shock our modern, sterile sensibilities to the foundations. We're in a city teeming with life, uh, where pestilence and poverty sat cheek by jowl with, with great wealth and riches. It was here, with his poetry and plays, that William Shakespeare, the bard, grew into one of the towering figures of world literature. We are in London's Bankside at the Globe Theatre. We are in the Globe Theatre on the south bank of the Thames in London. It's one of those that's a favourite of mine for a particular reason. It fits into that group that, for example, has the Wars of the Roses, which took us to Westminster Abbey. In the case of the Globe, it's special because Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, who means so much to anyone who's interested in literature, the English language, drama, who stands taller in that context than William Shakespeare? And yet he's surprisingly absent from the historical record as a real person. But, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. But the Globe is somewhere you can go in search of Shakespeare. And the Globe, therefore, is unique in the hundred places because it's a modern reconstruction 
of a theatre that was there in the in the 17th century but that no longer exists. It was closed down for the last time in the first half of the of the 17th century and it was re- recreated. So it's not even real, you might say. It's a real building and it looks wonderfully authentic and it's located as close as seemed reasonable to the known original location of William Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. So so everything about it makes it a bit of a standout odd place. But it fits in a way because Shakespeare's who he is, the bard, the man who wrote a million words and plays that are so familiar to everyone, Hamlet, The Tempest, King Lear, Romeo and Juliet, and yet he himself, as it were, exited stage left (laughs) and (laughs) disappeared like a special effect. And his absence is almost perfect in a way. So that's the context for the the globe. It's bound up with all sorts of good memories for me. As a couple, my wife and I, we've spent a lot of time on the South Bank of the Thames. Weekends away and, and holidays. We've been there as a family. We've taken the kids there. We've had the kids in the globe. It's part of our uh, family story. Years and years ago, and I wasn't with Trudy at the time, I must I must underline this fact, but when she lived in London, she used to go to the Globe and stand underneath the sky, and she, she often went with friends. And famously, Mark Rylance was on stage. Mark Rylance, great English actor, famous for a lot of work with Shakespeare. According to the family legend, he stopped mid-performance and gave my wife the glad eye. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked, he stared at her for so long that somebody she was with shouted out, Oh, come on! <laughs> and Mark Ryland started acting again. So, anyway, that's the story. So, the Globe is, is somewhere that we've been, Trudy and I, a bit, and, and as a family, we've just you know felt connected to. One of the many things I love about the Globe is that it belongs to a time when London was unrecognisable to us. Tudor London was a filthy place. The London that William Shakespeare knew and lived in and worked in and wrote in, I doubt if many of us fussy, super hygienic 21st century people, I doubt if we could have handled it for more than a few moments. The Tudor period was not a time of great personal hygiene. So there were all these people, 200,000 people estimated, were living in a space bound by the city wall that was maybe three miles from east to west and maybe a couple of miles, two and a half miles north to south. 200,000 people in there. And they were jam-packed together. Higgledy-piggledy streets. The way the streets were constructed, the buildings would get wider as they got taller. And so what was a, a street or a lane at street level, as the buildings went up, they kind of came out like, tears on a wedding cake, but going the other way, so that once they were five or six stories high, they would be touching, so that the streets became like alleyways. There was no plumbing, no sewerage system, uh, so everything that was made by these unwashed bodies was just tipped out into the street and ran in in central drains. In winter time, the cold and the and the frost might have kept a lid on the on the stench. But in summertime, you can only imagine what the place smelled like. Everything, human waste, animal waste, food scraps, rubbish, all the rest of it. It was just a pestilent congregation of vapors, as Shakespeare himself might have put it. And I lo- I love the idea of what an assault on the senses Shakespeare's London would have been. And that's a, that's a fascination when you go to the South Bank now and you walk along and you walk past the globe to remember what it would have been like, what that place would have been like. The city was bounded by walls, a wall wrapping around it. Uh, and there were seven gates through it. And at the gates, the city fathers were in the habit of exhibiting the dismembered body parts of criminals who'd been executed and butchered and their various parts hung up as warnings to the general population. So there was that aspect to it as well. The only bridge across the Thames at the time was London Bridge. So that was the only way to cross the river. And where the arms and legs and and torsos and whatever were hung up around the the seven gates, the heads of traitors were exhibited on spikes at the southern end of the bridge. So to imagine a walk through the London of that time, <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just quite something. 
it would have been quite the place to behold in every conceivable way. There were all sorts of edicts banning construction around various parts of the city, but nobody paid the blind bit of notice to it because they needed homes and, and shops and all the rest. So things were built, but because it was illegal to do so, they were built in a temporary fashion without foundations and so on. So it was real slums, real sort of shanty town aspect to a lot of it because they might have to be demolished or they might be demolished for you at a moment's notice. So people were living in these unbelievably squalid conditions. The Norman Tower of the Tower of London would have been there. St Paul's Cathedral in its first iteration would have been there. And then all sorts of alleyways and streets and lanes crowded around it and people living these busy, pestilent, filthy lives. 200,000 of a population, which meant that it was only Naples and Paris in the whole of Europe were as big or bigger than London in terms of population. The next biggest city in England at the time was Norwich, which only had 15,000 people. So a city of 200,000 would have been notable. The death tolls were, were extraordinary from outbreaks of every kind of disease you can imagine. For 300 years by Shakespeare's time, the plague, the bubonic plague, the Black Death, was kept on recurring. So that every now and again there'd be an outbreak of plague that would sweep away hundreds, thousands of people. The sort of chronicles of the time talk about all sorts of fevers and fluxes and frenzies and foul evils. There was consumption, dysentery, measles, rickets, scurvy, and heaven knows what else. So people were being harvested on a grand scale. But fortunately or unfortunately, London was also a great centre for migration from the surrounding countryside. So for all the people that were dying, there was a constant flow of new people coming in to take their best chance with the place. And it was a centre of manufacture and early industry. Uh, so as if the place wasn't smelly enough, you had industries like brewing and tanning. Tanning, tanning hide into leather was a filthy business. It involved the use of animal urine and animal excrement. So the, the smells associated with those industries would only have added to it. So just think for a minute about what a thick, what a thick and fetid air must have been around so much of London at that time. Despite all that, which seems almost unbearable to us today, it was still such a draw for people. Yeah, well, people are drawn. I mean, where there's muck, there's brass. As they always have done and as they always will do, people make for places like London because they believe the streets are paved with gold or they believe that if they can get in there to places like New York or Paris or they believe if they can get to the big city, bright lights, they can make a fortune. And some do, but most don't. Uh, but the gravitational pull of a place like London is, is eternal. And running through it all, of course, bigger, more impressive than anything man-made at that time, well, at any time, uh, it was the Thames. London is there because of the Thames and because of the crossing on the Thames at London Bridge, which was, you know, the first bridge at that point on the, on the Thames was built by Romans, and there was a bridge there ever since. And the Thames was, goodness knows what the water quality was like in the Thames, because so much of that filth was getting tipped untreated into the river. But nonetheless, people were fishing from it and pulling all sorts of fish out of it and eating the fish. And there were porpoises and whales and a whole cornucopia of life was in the Thames as well. So... I always think back to London at any time, but certainly at that time, and think of it as just the seething, steaming, petri dish of life and humanity and, and everything else, and everything else besides. Does it horrify your modern sensibilities? No. No, it doesn't. I've always been... When I think about... Scarabray. You know, we've talked about Scarabray, the, the Neolithic village on, on Orkney, and the houses there were semi-subterranean, and they were basically built into a midden, which is to say, a rubbish heap. The people used their own rubbish and waste as yet more insulation to pack around themselves. And there were no precious little in the way of windows and doors in Scarabray, so it was all these confined small spaces packed with people. And I've often wondered what Scarabray smelt like as well. I think about that all the time, you know, when you watch films like um, Pride and Prejudice and you watch maybe a scene where the, all the people are gathered together for a ball, for a dance, and you watch all these people in a room exercising vigorously in the form of dance, and you think of all these mostly unwashed bodies and, frankly, unwashed clothes or, or not washed in the way that we would consider them washed. And you think by the end of the night, if you'd walked into that room, no antiperspirant, no deodorant, precious little perfume. You know, you think what these places must have been like. 
But no, it doesn't put me off. It's all part of what adds, I think, to the texture when you imagine what the past was like. One of the things to imagine is, frankly, what the past smelt like. We're all obsessed with having a shower every day or more and changing our clothes, wearing antiperspirants and perfumes and all the rest and brushing our teeth and using mouthwash and fluoride toothpaste and all the rest of it. When you think about the reality of what it must have been like to be in close proximity to lots of people for most of the time, heavens above, no dentistry, nobody getting fillings, nobody getting their rotten teeth treated. The whole thing's just beggar's belief. So, you know, into that world steps William Shakespeare. And he would absolutely have made for the bank side because it was outside the city walls. And because it was outside the city walls, some of the edicts and faintly Puritan laws, if they applied elsewhere, they weren't applied so vigorously in a place like Bankside. So you had the sort of bear pits and the cockfighting and, and the theatres. Because at that time, the authorities, as they always are, they're suspicious about anywhere that lots of people gather together. We've got it now with the lockdown. What are the first things they shut? Pubs, restaurants, football grounds, gigs. The authorities are always wary about where people are gathering because they worry about what they might be talking about. And so it was, and so there was always a tendency to clamp down on these places. And actors were, you know, they were down there with the ruffians and the rest of the untrustworthy, undesirables living on the fringes of society. And that's where somebody like Shakespeare would have gone. And as I said at the top, for someone who's so famous in that everyone has heard of Shakespeare, he appears in the historical record hardly at all which is a real conundrum. We know that he was baptised. His name is mentioned on the record in Stratford-upon-Avon on the 26th of April, 1564. And then he vanishes again. And towards the end of November, 1582, he applied for a marriage licence, probably to Anne Hathaway, although it's, it's not actually stated, but that's probably who he had in mind. And Anne was... We know that Anne Hathaway, his wife, was eight years older than him. Uh, she gave birth to their eldest daughter, Susanna, in May 1583. And then after that, she had twins, Hamnet, not Hamlet, Hamnet and Judith. And they were born in the February of 1585. So there's these scant mentions of his name. That's all we've got. It's on official documents now and again. In 1592, he was identified and named as an actor and playwright in London. We know that he did well because he bought land and houses in Stratford, and then in 1613 he bought a house in London. So his playwriting and his acting was earning him a good living. He wrote and signed a will, and when he did die, he was buried in the chancel of Holy Trinity Church in Stratford, where he'd been baptised. That's it. That's the mentions of William Shakespeare. He wrote a million words plus of uh, plays and poetry, but we've got nothing for certain in his own hand. There is a copy of a play called Sir Thomas More about St Thomas More, who's amongst the many buried in St Peter's Church in the Tower of London. It's handwritten, and some Shakespeare experts, specialists, say it's, it's in his handwriting. But how would they know that? <laughs> because they've got, nothing el- they've got nothing else to compare it to. So there's certainly no consensus about that. So how ironic, the ultimate writer. And we don't know what his handwriting looked like. But in any event, we know he was there. We know he was in London. We know he was in Bankside. And he was at the dodgy end of town, where all the brothels and the gambling houses and all the rest of it. By the 1590s, he was one of a company of actors called the Lord Chamberlain's Men. And they, amongst other things, they had the use of a theatre in Shoreditch. It was just called the theatre. But then in 1597, their lease on it ran out. And this is great. It was a wooden structure, a wooden frame, like everything was. Most buildings at the time were just, we would consider them almost temporary structures. So the, the structure was owned by James Burbage and his two sons, Cuthbert and Richard. And Richard was another member of the company. He was another actor. And so they they decided that since they didn't own the land, they were paying a a lease on the land, but they did own the building, so they just took the building away. (laughs) They just packed it up. Like an Ikea flat pack. They just took it to bits and carted it away and left an open plot behind them. And so they took it down onto Bankside and they rebuilt it and they called it The Globe. 
So finally, by the last couple of years of the of the 16th century, and certainly into the 17th century, the theatre called The Globe is on its site. We know from illustrations of the time that it was typical of theatres at the time, which is to say it was open-roofed, unroofed. So there was a kind of a circular structure of timber and, and sort of wattle and daub, and there was a thatched roof around the outside of it, but then the rest of it was open to the sky. So the staging and most of the people were out, exposed to the elements, and then there were, there were more expensive seating where you were actually under the roof and you could look down and you could sit and you could be in shelter, but most people would just have stood. So the globe, looking like that, was gro- going great guns. Uh, and it, it was there for a dozen years more, and people came to see plays, amongst others, that Shakespeare had written himself. So we know that there were productions of the ha- of Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, Othello, and Twelfth Night, and probably others besides. And then after maybe 12, 14 years, they, was, they were doing a performance of Henry VIII in 1613, the June of 1613, and as a kind of a stage effect, they detonated a cannon. And it didn't have a cannonball in it, but it had wadding in it with a gun to hold the gunpowder in place and some of the wadding caught fire in mid-air and it landed on the thatched roof and the thatched roof caught fire in the building <laughs> everyone got out as far as we know everyone got out alive but the building burnt to the ground but they were determined and undeterred and they, they built a new globe on the same site and it lasted until 1642 <laughs> At the time of what was called the Long Parliament, around the time of the English Civil War, there were Puritans in control of things and they didn't like, they particularly didn't like theatres and actors, those kind of people. And plays were described as lascivious mirth and levity and they considered the actors just vagrants, troublemakers and performances of plays were just likely to be a source of people having a good time. And quite often the authorities don't like that. And employers didn't like the idea that people had somewhere else to go apart from their work. <laughs> so, there are all sorts of people. So by 1644, the Globe, like the rest of the theatres in London, was just shut down, driven out of business. And at that point, it's gone. The Globe is gone. Until, and this is the truly amazing thing, Sam Wanamaker, who's an American actor, director, uh, his daughter Zoe Wanamaker, you know, that was in the Harry Potter films. Um, and many other things besides. Sam Wanamaker, hugely famous as well. And he was obsessed with Shakespeare and the Globe. And between 1969 until he died in 1993, he went to the ends of the earth, raising money and support and sponsorship to rebuild a recreation of the Globe Theatre. And that's what's there now. And it's down to Sam Wanamaker, an American thespian who was determined to see the thing come back. And there it is. So you go down to on, onto Bankside and you see this real oddity, this whitewashed polygonal, building with this tonsure of thatch around it and it's always busy Shakespeare is such an endless fascination scholars have wondered for years there's always been allegations or suggestions that he didn't even write the plays Sir Francis Bacon wrote the plays or other people wrote the plays or, or he had help but the fact is those plays exist we have them with us there they are And together with the King James, the authorised version of the Bible that we already talked about in the context of Hampton Court Palace, the twin foundation blocks of the English language that we appreciate today are the English of the King James Bible and Shakespeare's plays. It's echoing and woven through the language that we use to this day. And the fact that he is missing The fact that he disappeared as though in a special effect, a stage effect, it just seems to me perfect. Such an elegant departure. And what he left behind is what mattered to him, which are his words, and his words are immortal. And I'm always looking for places where I'm fascinated by a person or an event. I I want to go to where I think I can get close to it. That's part of the ethos of my love letter to the British Isles. And if you want to even fantasise or dream about being close to Shakespeare, you can go to the Globe. And it's there or thereabouts that that his Globe Theatre stood. And you could go into the reconstructed Globe and you could look up at the circle of sky that's framed by the thatched roof and you could think that maybe it's more or less the same circle of sky that William Shakespeare looked up at while he was performing 
on the stage of his own Globe Theatre. And there's the Thames. The Thames is right there flowing by. They say you can never step into the same river twice, which is true enough, because it's always flowing, like time, like life. It's flowing past. Old Father Thames is just flowing past all the time. I'm not an expert on English literature or the plays of Shakespeare, but I've read a lot of them, I've seen a lot of them, and he is just undeniably magical. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings. Carry them here and there, jumping over times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. And so it is with time. So go to the globe and think about William Shakespeare. When you go there, do you sink into the fetid air of 17th century London? <laughs> well, this is it. This is, I mean, that's part of it. You know, you go there and you think how different would have been the context for the original globe. You go there now and it's within the fabric of modern London. It looks out of place because it's built in 17th century style. But there it is. You look out at the glass buildings, the glass towers of, of modern London, and that's part of the thrill, is, is trying with your mind's eye, maybe with your mind's nose, uh, briefly to imagine what it would have been like to be in the vicinity of the Globe Theatre in Shakespeare's day. Does actually being in a building like this make it easier to step back in time? Yes, it's like a it's like a stepping stone. It's like a uh, it's like an an aid memoir, or it's a key that you can turn in a lock. It's something to help you. There are fragments of London all around. You know, the Tower of London. There's there's fragments of the old city wall, old London, ancient London, Roman London, and, and every period thereafter is is there. Tiny islands of it. But it can be hard to imagine, hard to put yourself there. But thanks to Wanamaker and, and his efforts around the globe, if you're in search of Shakespearean London and a sense of what that world was like, you can go there and you can catch just the faintest glimpse of, of old London town. Lush and green, with beautiful coves and bays. A Norman castle, rooted on a rocky outcrop. The fortress of jewels. Barbary corsairs prowling the Irish coast, casting a dark shadow of violence and slavery over it. Capturing and shipping off a whole town to a life unimaginable. The horror of slavery leaving an indelible imprint. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast, which is and always will be free, and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. I'd love to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research was undertaken by Evie, Lucy and Archie and Teddy. Finance is taken care of by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios. And the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.